Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Fagan Radian here at Bell's Advanced Future Vertical Lift Center in Northern Virginia, where the company has just unveiled its proposal in the United States Army's competition for a future attack reconnaissance aircraft, the FARA, uh, that would replace uh, the Kiowa Warrior uh, that was retired some years ago. That mission was picked up by the Apache, but the Army is looking for that capability. And uh, Bell's proposal is the Bell 360 Invictus. And joining us uh, to discuss the program are two men in uh, involved with this. Keith Flail, who's the Vice President for Advanced Future Vertical Lift Systems uh, at Bell, a retired United States Army Lieutenant Colonel and former Kiowa Warrior pilot, and Frank Lanza, who's a uh, retired United States Air Force Lieutenant Colonel with experience in originally in the United States Army where you flew the Kiowa Warrior, then you went to the airplane, uh, Air Force where you flew uh, the Palo, uh, Pavlo, the uh, MH-53, incredible uh, uh, tiny little airplane, so you bookended it pretty pretty nicely, and then the MV-22 as well, which the United States Air Force shares in common with the United States Marine Corps. Gentlemen, thanks very, very much for joining us. Keith, I want to start with you. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, be, uh, the Bell 360 Invictus, and also full disclosure, Bell sponsors the Defense and Aerospace Report weekly podcast, so uh, just get that on the table. Tell us a little bit about the Invictus. Anybody who knows about helicopters uh, knows there's a little bit of Comanche DNA uh, that looks like it's in the design of the aircraft, but I think that's uh, driven by the requirement. Tell us about your proposal. So with our Bell 360 Invictus, uh, we at Bell were committed to providing the Army the most affordable, most sustainable, lowest risk, least complex solution that will meet all the fair requirements. So when you first look at uh, our FARA offering, you see a single main rotor helicopter. However, as you do the walk around on the aircraft, you see a lot of key features that we believe make it uh, a very um, special solution in terms of the design knobs that you can turn without increasing uh, complexity unnecessarily. So first of all, the uh, fully articulated rotor system, a lot of uh, reuse off of the 525 program, our civil uh, aircraft, a fly-by-wire aircraft at Bell. Um, that aircraft has surpassed 200 knots of airspeed, fully articulated rotor system, uh, high-speed hub. Uh, the R-Fara offering is powered by a single uh, improved turbine engine. We couple that with a supplemental uh, power unit, uh, like an APU, except we plug it in and get extra horsepower out of it. Uh, we've put the lift sharing wing on the aircraft, so when you get up to 180 knots, 50% uh, is offloaded to the wing, so you can use your uh, fully articulated rotor as a propulsor, so we don't, we don't need another propulsor on the aircraft. Um, looking uh, also at the integrated munitions launcher, so the, the munitions are kept in the body of the aircraft and only uh, actuated out when you need to uh, do an engagement, so you're keeping the drag down on the aircraft. Uh, moving towards the back of the aircraft, you have an active horizontal stabilizer, so that keeps the aircraft trimmed in the best possible uh, attitude to minimize drag in forward flight. And then last, we have a ducted, canted uh, tail rotor, which provides uh, benefits both in hover and at high speeds. So coupling all those features together, the integration and optimization of those with your fly-by-wire flight control system uh, gets you the, the, the requirements that you need uh, for this aircraft with a very elegant solution but without being exotic, ensuring that we have the minimal complexity because the Army's going to have this aircraft for a long time and it always comes down to your, your uh, rotors, your gearboxes, and your flight controls. That's what drives uh, your ONS costs downstream. So having an aircraft that can live in the dirt and that can operate as this uh, knife fighter that the, uh, that the Army needs is what we're focused on. Um, and what are uh, the parameters, right? I mean, you obviously have a two-person crew. That's part of the Army requirement. Uh, how many munitions, what kind of range are you talking about? And you mentioned 180 knots. That's pretty fast for a helicopter, including in this, uh, in this class. What's the kind of top speed you guys are shooting for? Because the Army wants everything to be faster, more agile, and more lethal in the future. Yeah, great question. So uh, Frank and I and you know, the Kaio Warrior world, you know, 90 knots is about what you get. So here you're talking at least uh, 2x, 180 knots, uh, for at uh, exceeding 180 knots at uh, max continuous power, uh, the ability to go out, um, the mission radius of 135 nautical miles, stay on station for 90 minutes and come back, uh, 1,400 pounds of payload, um, so those are a lot of the, the, the key attributes that uh, we're focused on. The Army gave several different missions for us to look at, and they asked industry to provide those trades on speed, range, uh, payload, and endurance for the different mission sets that they have. Because if you're looking at multi-domain operations, you have to have an aircraft that has the ability to dash very quick, quickly, but still has to be a, an efficient hovering machine that can do the classic uh, reconnaissance and security missions that they've been doing with uh, cavalry for years. Um, and obviously you're going to have the electro-optic suite uh, as, as well as uh, a radar capability. How many um, 
missiles does the Army want? I mean, sort of Hellfire equivalents does the Army want on the uh, aircraft? So right now, with the uh, the integrated munitions launcher, that's that's one of the, the things we're working on with the Army is uh, the, the volume that you can carry on the inside of the aircraft, so that you're you're focused on the, the ability to carry Hellfires as well as rockets and some new uh, air launched effects that they're looking at as part of the uh, FEL umbrella of systems. So it's really a, a multi-purpose um, bay, if you will, with the integrated munitions launcher as well as the 20, mil uh, 20 millimeter cannon that's on the front of the aircraft. Um, Frank, let me uh, bring you into the conversation. Uh, you were, uh, you know, both of you were operators. Um, you know, is the Army going to be comfortable with a single engine uh, attack helicopter? I mean, the last time the Army had that was, um, I think if you go back to the original version of the Cobra, which was a uh, single engine and an Army inventory was always a single engine airplane. Is the single engine capability going to be something you think that, uh, you know, your former service is going to balk at at all when they see the design? Oh, I don't think they'll balk at it at all. I mean, we're listening to our customer, and we're actually delivering what we think they've asked for, so I'm not concerned about that. And, you know, there are things we're building into the aircraft to consider single-engine aircraft and safety, survivability, not to include, Keith mentioned, the tail rotor or the shrouded tail rotor. It's a safety feature for practicing touchdown auto rotations, for example. So, um, and the addition of, like, our supplemental power unit that we talked about, I won't get deep into that, but I'll tell you that uh, for a loss of an engine, the supplemental power unit can increase auto rotative capability. So those are things we're considering as we design this, air or get ready to build this aircraft. And, and then the Kai Warrior also was a single engine airplane also. So, you know, uh, f f fair enough there in terms of sort of a one for one, for one fit. Um, the Army is looking at this capability as being uh, critical uh, and there are assessments that suggest that something low-flying nap of the earth is what's going to be most successful in an anti-access area denial environment. Um, talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, attributes and features the airplane is going to have in order to be able to give it that kind of capability down low uh, in highly um, contested environments. Because there are some in your other former service who would say, you know, that that that's going to be too vulnerable. And, you know, there are some in the Air Force who say that, you know, such kind of low-flying aircraft are going to be more vulnerable. Why do you think this is the right solution for the kind of threat in the future? Well, two reasons. One, the threat has changed out there and the capabilities have changed. And despite the fact that the average American would like to believe we have an answer for everything, we don't. So the old construct where, you know, the Army comes in after the hole is made is not always necessarily going to be the case. And so the enablers are really range and speed, right? Range allows you to operate from areas that are safer. Let's use the word sanctuary or relative sanctuary, but still actually range the threat or your part of the, you know, assigned penetration, breach, whatever the case may be with that range and that speed, right? And then I would also argue that, um, so not just the combination, so we like to say this aircraft is, the whole really is the sum of its parts here, right? That's where the advanced capability comes from. It's the same thing with lethality or performance on the battlefield. You have to have all these things, not the least of which is availability, reliability, aka the Kyle Warrior in that spirit. So when it comes to, you know, down in the trees, highly agile, will exceed level one handling qualities, we haven't compromised on that to get to speed and range. Another advantage of this configuration, the wing in high speed actually provides more maneuverability, can assist in increasing that, uh, that solution to something that's more effective. So all those things combined, but again, I'm back to range and speed as a former tilt rotor guy. Uh, those carry you an awful long way. And when you can get to, the, get to the fight from further away, you're protected in your sanctuary, and then you have options on the way to and once you get there to include that loiter piece. And once the aircraft becomes, you know, into the pure helicopter mission again, it is down low NOE into the clutter of the, you know, the trees or the urban environment, whatever the case may be. Uh, we haven't sacrificed anything to get to those range and speed numbers. So. Um, let me uh, bring you into this, Keith. I mean, you guys are working very hard on the 280 Valor uh, program. You're working on the 247, the Vigilant, uh, Vigilant as well. Uh, that's the Marine Corps program, but you guys see a lot of application. Um, I know Army guys have mentioned to me the kind of capability that, that they find attractive about that. What are the elements of those programs that are going into this? Because Bell has uh, adopted a very integrated one product feeding and supporting the other. You mentioned the 525 is, is having some DNA, you know, the Invictus having some of that 525 DNA in it. Talk to us about how all of the pieces that you're working on for all of these different programs are also feeding into this. Yeah, great question. So uh, at Bell, what it's, it's all about cycles of learning. So if you look at our pace over the last several years in terms of the development cycles, using all these advanced tools and digital thread with the 525 program, the 505, uh, the V280, as you mentioned, 
uh, V247, and now with the Invictus for our uh, FARA offering. So we're able to, to turn these aircraft faster and faster, so it's a lot of different enablers that we're looking at. So what are some of our manufacturing technologies? What are the different things that we're doing in terms of our processes, our tools, our human capital? So some of the cadre that came from the V280 program that came over to FARA, just, just having that understanding of what it takes to get it done, to get through the preliminary design, the critical design, get your parts released, um, get your parts made, get them on dock, how we accelerate the assembly. Through every stage of that cycle, we're getting better and better and we're learning more and more in terms of other areas that we can continue to tweak and improve uh, so that we can do this. You look at the JMR program, which we've just executed, uh, V280, as you mentioned, flying over 300 knots, the uh, op tempo of that aircraft, the early reliability, all of those things that we did early on in V280 that have paid off tremendously, having those cross-functional teams work together early on so that you're laying out the aircraft with sustainability baked in uh, from the outset and reliability as well, so that when the Army has this aircraft, you know, in the inventory, downstream, and it's in the dirt, and it's in the fight, what have you done to reduce the complexity of very reliable, uh, dynamic components so that you can maintain this aircraft and you can afford to maintain this aircraft as the, bed, the budget tends to uh, ebb and flow. So it's a, it's a variety of all those things coming together so that the FARA program, it's basically a year shorter than what we just did for joint multi-role. Had we not had our success on joint multi-role to carry it forward to this one, it might not be doable. But now we have a compressed timeline, and we believe that we can get this aircraft built on the flight line and have first flight in uh, late FY22 uh, per the government schedule. Um, uh, two questions, Frank. Uh how, how are you working with uh, the customer, right? I mean, one of the things I think Bell did very thoughtfully is to bring Army aviators over uh, to Texas so that they actually experience tilt rotor operations. Everybody who's used them sort of gets it, whereas Army guys were like, no, you know, we need a helicopter, whereas the more comfortable they've gotten with tilt rotors. I, I mean, I remember that big argument in the early 90s where there were Army guys who very, very badly wanted tilt rotors, uh, and the Army decided, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to stick to the platforms uh, that we have. How are you working with the customer to make sure that you are in complete sync as you develop this and that the airplane, you know, once it, you know, obviously it's a competitive and highly competitive program that's on a very, very aggressive timeline that everybody sort of arrives exactly where they want to be when they want to be there. Well, I would say there's uh, two primary methods. One is we go out there and talk to them. Every opportunity to get, we're talking to somebody from Futures Command or the CFT or just even the grassroots Army aviator, so we can inform them about what we're doing and ask them what they'd like to see. And we have some very experienced uh, retired Army pilots, combat proven veterans who work for Bell. We tap into that knowledge. So the second part of that is we have, we are on contract. So we have Army personnel in our meetings. We are deeply, um, you know, connected through those meetings, through the share of information as required by the contract. We are, we kept the momentum going from JMRTD and the relationships there. And, the, you know, there's a trust there that we have developed with the Army through that process. And we're just going to keep that going on through uh, this program. One of the key things, uh, and this is to the both of you, there are folks who are asking that the other transaction authority is a very, very, and, and the aggressive schedule are either going to be an out of the park home run or a recipe for disaster. You've been involved in the business for a while. You've also got a, a operational uh, pedigree. I, I mean, are you, is it, is it going as smoothly? It, what are the challenges? Is this actually an executable program? Because if I look at the V280, you guys had an eight year drop to bring the technology to a maturation level where you are right now, and that goes for everybody who's involved in the program. Whereas this was announced recently and everybody wants an operational airplane in four years, that's awesome. If you can get there, is it achievable? Yeah, so with the, with the OTA, the other transaction authorities you mentioned, you know, there is the, the cost share piece that we have to bring uh, from, from industry. Um, candidly, you know, we had a very heavy investment with uh, Team Valor, Bell, and all of our teammates in order to bring that uh, aircraft to fruition. So it, the, the, the government certainly got a lot of value from industry to move that forward. Um, so as we look at FARA, uh, also an OTA, the, the, the cost share is, is a different situation where it's uh, two-thirds government, one-third from the industry and, and the teammates. So we're, we're still, you know, looking to move forward to, the, to the, the, the fully funded efforts because of what we've done on our, on our side, uh, but we understand why the government's doing this. Uh, some of the uh, opportunities they have to accelerate, you know, going with this path with the other transaction authority and, and using some of the consortiums, it does allow them to move uh, more quickly to get to the capability. It forces industry to buy in so that you have skin in the game, certainly. Um, but we believe at Bell, we've continued to show that uh, we're good partners uh, with the Army, ready to move forward, ready to get into you know, engineering and manufacturing develop, L, development, uh, LRIP, get into production and get this capability to the warfighters. So 
Um, I think we are progressing at a very, very quick pace, just looking at the government meeting their commitments on their side to get these, uh, um, each of these stages completed with the down select for FARA is going to be in the March uh, time frame. So things are moving very, very quickly. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a great journey in terms of the, the partnership of the, the learning together that we've been able to do with uh, um, uh, government and industry together. Uh, the, the, the JMR example in terms of everything uh, that we've been able to do to burn down risk and inform requirements and show a new way uh, that you can do business so that you can get on with the programs. I think that is very healthy. It's just uh, some of the cost share. How long does it go on? Because at the end of the day, um, that, that does get to be a little bit tough on the business side to be able to um, do everything you need to do and meet your meet all of your uh, commitments. And uh, Frank, I mean, is the cross-functional team approach right? I mean, there was a little bit of concern how the Army acquisition people will be working with uh, the cross-functional teams that are uh, at Army, the new Army Futures Command. How is that in a relationship and relationship going uh, because Bell and each of the contractors is going to have an enormous amount of, you know, a third of it is your money that's going into this program initially. There are a lot of stakes, uh, obviously, on the so table. So are you asking between us and those entities or be what do we see between well, the two? Uh, yeah, I mean, just the overall relationship, right? I mean, there are some folks who've got concerns uh, that Futures Command, you know, is looking at it perhaps a little bit differently, for example, in the acqu Army uh, acquisition yeah. core, the, tr the traditional way of going and buying these things. How are all of these interrelationships going, you, industry, uh, within the Army, how is that team working as you try to work with them in order to be able to, to deliver this capability? Well, honestly, I can't speak for how they feel about it internally, but from the outside, it looks like it's going pretty well. We routinely hear anecdotes of collaboration between the new and the uh, established, so to speak. Um, and then I would say pretty wide open when it comes to answering our questions or providing information, updates, uh, change clarification. Um, we're, we're not experiencing friction, and our observations are, it looks like it's going to work out. Fantastic. And one last question. Are you going to rename the 280, the V300 now, that it's actually a 300-knot airplane? Because it was 280 because it was supposed to be 280 knots. You beat it by 20. Name change? Well, the V280, well, you know, it's, it's got such a great brand at this point. I don't think that we would, uh, we would change the name. Even, actually, in the early days, it's interesting you bring that up. There was some discussion of calling it the, uh, the V300. Uh, the aircraft has performed uh, incredibly well. The op tempo we've been able to achieve, the early reliability that we're seeing out of that aircraft, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And, and I, I really uh, credit much of that to these processes in terms of how we started the program to have the right cross-functional team work on all, all this so that we avoided the rework downstream and we were thinking about all those sustainability things up front. Um, but the fact that you know we've been able to get over 300 on, on V280, it's absolutely fantastic um, machine and it's, it's going to um, do great things for our warfighter. That's awesome. Keith, thanks very much. Thanks, really appreciate it. Frank, uh, great great talking to you. Uh, retired United States, uh, uh, originally United States Army, but retired United States Air Force Colonel and retired uh, Lieutenant Colonel and retired United States uh, Army Lieutenant Colonel Keith Flail. Thanks very much, guys. Really appreciate it. Best of luck. Very cool airplane and look forward to tracking it as it goes through development. Thanks, Vago. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure.